Okay, so now that you're listening, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Judith Alexander, and me and two of my cohorts, Debbie Steele, who's down over there in the striped shirt, and Carla Main, who just sat down, uh, the three of us started conversations under this tent last fall. And we had about four of them. And the nature of those conversations was to talk about whether our community could get it together to create a permanent village for chronically homeless people. The Community Build Project was the outgrowth from that impulse and we just felt concerned about our most vulnerable citizens. But now the tent is being utilized for a broader context with a broader audience. And um, my job is to tell you a little bit about today's event. It's the first of hopefully four or more events on Thursdays that are called Under the Tent Conversations. So first of all, I want to thank Jim Lyman. Is Jim here, by the way? Jim is the minister of this church, and I, don't, I haven't seen him. But So Carla, Debbie, and I have each been captivated by the housing challenges that we face as a community. Carla and I are active within Housing Solutions Network, and Debbie and I are active within the Community Build, both all of which is faced, you know, helping us deal with finding housing solutions. Um, we each have our own motivations. You know, Carla, Carla's motivation is she wants to engage people. She wants to get people involved in finding solutions. I'm more a researcher. I'm running a test as to whether compassion can become more important than capitalism. I love the response. Thank you so much. I'm optimistic about my... <laughs> okay. Market forces do seem to have so much power and influence. They're changing the price of housing in our community like overnight so much. But you know what? I believe we have power and influence too. And it's through our relationships and our connections with each other and our caring for the depth of our community sense that many of us have enjoyed in Jefferson County that really propel me to be involved in housing solutions. I don't want to lose the kind of community I've lived in for 45 years at all. So uh, most of us are aware of the pressures of outside changes and we're also very aware of the growing desperation of those people who do not have enough while others have more than we need. For me, that's starting to be pretty painful. So I'm also motivated by my pain to kind of level the playing field however I can and it's a challenge. In, in staging this event, we want to inspire and engage you too. It's going to take all of us working together to retain what we love about the community here. Those of us that have gotten involved in various types of solutions end up finding happiness, connection, purpose, and such satisfaction when we roll up our sleeves and contribute our special talents to an overall shared goal. It's the power of our relationships with each other that can make things happen, often with unexpected and quick success. So we've engaged an amazing lineup of speakers for you today. Most of them are sitting in the front row here wearing name tags that look like mine. And each organization only gets two minutes and we ask them to respond to two questions in that two-minute time period. What is your project or organization doing to help create housing solutions and how can the public, you guys, help them succeed? Okay, I'm introducing my friend and cohort for the first two minutes, Debbie Steele. Come on up here to talk to you about Community Bell. And please hold your introductory applause because we're going to be having the next speaker introduce the next speaker. We don't need to applaud then, but you do need to applaud at the end. My name is Debbie Steele, and I am the volunteer coordinator for Community Build. Am I too loud? No. No, okay. Um, our mission is inspired by compassion for our unsheltered neighbors. We're engaging our community in building secure housing while strengthening community for us all. I'm so thirsty. Community Build began in the fall of 2020 as an ad hoc group of volunteers who started building tiny wood shelters to protect unsheltered neighbors during the upcoming winter. The volunteers had no idea where the shelters could be located, but they had confidence that a place would be found. As word spread, more and more volunteers and donors, both businesses and individuals, joined the effort. By the winter of 2022, Community Build had built two tiny shelter villages, Peter's Place in Port Hadlock and Pat's Place here in Port Townsend. Woo! 
In addition to the two villages, we have, just, we have completed a beautiful studio apartment for New Life Church, who came to us with an old, smelly shed and asked us to make it into a home, and we've done just that. When we began this project, our intention was to build community as well as shelter for our unsheltered neighbors. What we didn't realize is that we were also building community for ourselves. As a group of volunteers, we've created a loving, hardworking, and fun family, and we'd love for you to join us. What we want from you is for you to be a part of our team. Oh, my God. Uh, if you can use a hammer, if you can sew curtains, if you can paint, whatever you can contribute to the build. If you have a place for an ADU, we want you to let us provide the, the labor. You provide the materials and we'll build a home for one more person in this community. If you have land and could cr create a tiny village, we'll build it for you. There's a saying that I believe more and more since becoming a part of Community Build. Together we can. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your interest. And thank you for being a part of this conversation on housing. All right. Um, so I'm Mike Moore. If you guys don't know me, I work with Bayside. I'm the director of housing and asset management. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm new to this role, but just the love and the compassion that happens in this town is quite amazing. Um, big thanks to Community Build for shelters and everything and the uh, community boat project as well and hsn for all that they do as well uh we tend to focus on transitional housing right now so just getting people housing first and that shelter that they need and then with that we're advocates for their lifestyle we also do some case management pieces to it um, right now, we are working to expand into the Port Hadlock Motel. Uh, big thanks to Steve Theringer for a commerce-sponsored grant to help us fund that acquisition, and that's in the process of doing it. Um, yeah, pretty amazing stuff. Uh, um, let's see, what else we got here? Um, just... We do a lot of community collab, and as it keeps on growing and going, like just the people that come out here support us, you know, and it's we support each other and the community supports. And there's a lot of stuff that's going on with city ordinances and county ordinances that are going to make a big deal for what we can do in the future to provide that. So if you're looking for a space to step in and you don't know what to do, but you've got a voice or you can write or you can speak, join us on the council meetings, um, help the city figure out what's going on and what's needed. Um, voices are needed within that. I don't know what my time is right now. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, things that are coming up for us um, as far as what we do, we've got a big benefit concert and meal going on at uh, the OAP, who is our kind of our for-profit parent that funds a lot of what we do. 30 seconds, cool. Um, <laughs> So that's happening this Sunday. We also have something coming up in October 1st, which is the, I always mess up the name of it, the Townsend Bay Music Festival, and that'll be happening. That'll also be some uh, benefit pieces of what's going on. Um, and aside from that, just get plugged in with the people that are around at the tables. Come talk to us. If you're a little confused about what you want to do, but you know you want to help, we'll point you in the right direction. Um, or HSN will, or anybody else will. So uh, thank you all for coming out here. And I get the honor to introduce John Marrow and Emma Bolin for the city of Port Townsend. Hey, everybody. You, you look so gorgeous, I'm going to take a picture. All right, so two parts. I'm the first part, four points. And you could read about it as you probably did in the Business Insider. City plays basically four roles, and then Emma, I will introduce and tell you how you can play a role. Um, we play a direct role in housing because we provide infrastructure, we provide grant support, we do a lot of things directly, we do permitting. Second thing, we provide a partnership convening and grant making role in partnership with the county, who I'm sure will speak to that, or at least I should give a nod to it. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, that's important because that allows a lot of the folks in this room to be able to build and do the real thing. We also play a policy and advocacy role, not just in making policy, of which at least two city council members are here right now. Different hats they're wearing, but Councilmember Rowe and Deputy Mayor Howard. Yay. 
They fight the good fight making the difficult decisions to change policy, and then collectively we advocate for the change in policy at the state and federal level altogether as a community. The last thing we do is we play an education and engagement role, which is partly why we're here and are really honored to be here with such awesome community forces to join forces. And that's what this is all about. So I, I'm so grateful to be here. Come talk to Emma and I after this, but let me also now introduce Emma for the next minute. Emma Bolin, this is her fourth day. She's already been on the radio with me today. She's already been to a six hour strategic planning uh, retreat. Yeah. She's already met her team, had a number of conversations with external partners, including some of you right here. Please give Emma a warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you, John. Okay, well, my name is Emma Bolin, and as was mentioned, it's my fourth day as the Planning and Community Development Director for City of Port Townsend. So I'm very excited to be here, and what I'm going to talk about is how all of you can help um, uh, succeed in our housing goals. So I'm just going to say that you should show up. Just show up and come all the way through the process. So by that, I mean participate the whole way if you can in whatever way that you can so you're our partners the public is our partner and we want to have trust we want to have dialogue and communication and we want creativity um, so I want everybody to help everyone else understand including the city perception versus reality help us with the public education piece and um, let's just listen to each other and let's show each other all of the missed opportunities and I cannot wait to work with you all and um, thanks for the very warm welcome. The next is um, Miss Real with Coast. Yay! I'm Karen Real from Coast. Um, I do not live in Port Townsend so I'm uh, so I'm always a stranger when I come here. So you say, how did you get involved with Coast? Well, in about 19, no, 19, 20, 20, 20, 20, 25, um, I was getting really bored trying to build a house down in Brennan, a beautiful place to live. And I had come from social services and I met uh, four other ladies who decided that, you know, we got to do something. We've got we've got men living in the woods. We have they have them uh, drinking behind the uh, one stop, the stop. Place. Yeah, that was a popular place. We have them sleeping in the churches. So when we heard that, the ministers got together with us and said, you know, we got to do something. So um, we had, we talked to a number of people and found a model that probably would work. And so the churches opened their doors to homeless folks that first year. Um, so it's a, that's a big difference from where we are now. But it started really with people coming together saying, you know, we've got to find a solution to this and it's only going to get worse. And it did. The American Legion came forth and said, uh, hey, we've got a basement that's empty. And we thought it was the most beautiful place in the world. <laughs> and through, through a lot of grants and uh, a lot of hard work, uh, we have a full-size kitchen. Um, and we have places for people to sleep, take showers, which is really important, and provide the, and through OLICAP, provide case management and a wonderful accountability to the community. So what I'm looking for are volunteers. And I'm looking for people who belong to garden clubs, belong to sailing clubs, whatever club it is. If they like to come and provide a meal for anywhere from 10 to 15, 20 people um, for one night or for five nights. Um, we also collect uh, items for winter, winter clothing. We also um, have sock drives because socks are the most wonderful thing for people who are out on the street. <clears throat> and um, I also have a sand dollar award for any of you who have cooked a meal at the shelter or brought a meal in or donated winter clothing um, or socks or underwear or whatever. Come get your um, award. So, thank you. One more thing. Hey, Oli Cap's got a job opening. I've got information. We need an overnight monitor. So stop Hi, by. Hello. Hi. 
<laughs> I'm Chanel Hammond. I'm from the Community Boat Project, and I do community outreach, outreach and development with them. Uh, for those of you who know and were expecting Wayne, he sends his regards. He'd love to be here, but last minute he had to set off on a sea venture with about 10 high school kids. So he is currently on the water and will be back on Sunday. So Community Boat Project has started out as a project that took kids sailing on the water. And while we still do that, we have quite a few programs that we run at the moment. Uh, two of which I'd like to talk to you about today, just very, very briefly. We have a program called A New, which is always funny because it's a new program that is called A New. Gets people confused. Um, but we also have a program called Shelter from the Storm. And both of these programs help empower young people, so mainly high school students and youth, or young adults up to the age of about 32, 35, depending, to build their own tiny homes. So they come to us, we teach them the skills that they need for building, and then those tiny homes actually get donated into Bayside and end up at their um, penny home villages around town. Oh. Yeah, it's really great. All of our programs are free. Um, our programs sometimes do provide a stipend or pay, depending on who is coming in to us. Uh, obviously, if the children are you know, younger, then we're not going to be able to pay them for their time, but they're able to come volunteer with us. They can get school credits, they can get volunteer credits. Uh, there are just a lot of ways to make it feel really worthwhile for the kids. Ways that we could use help are obviously, you know, financial and material donations, but what really, really helps us are volunteers. Any sort of skill that you have is helpful. We're not just focusing on tiny homes, we're focusing on building community and building um, strength in kids. So if you know how to make instruments, if you know how to make band boxes, anything like that, please come to us. If you just want to help paint a house, we love having the intergenerational communication there. And if you could help get the word out about us, that'd be helpful as well. So. Hey. Hi, you. And I am introducing, introducing Jamie from Habitat for Humanity. Jamie! Habitat for Humanity brings people together to build homes, communities, and hope. We've been doing it for 24 years in Jefferson County now, and we just completed over the last six weeks four more homes. Um, yay! And dedicated them. We actually have completed a fifth one as well. Um, so we met a goal which we had was to do five homes in five months, and we we're really excited. Awesome. It takes a whole community to do this. And that's my ask. We need you. And Deputy Mayor Howard in the back, also known as Habitat for Humanities Volunteer Engagement Manager Amy, would love to talk to you about a day or an afternoon or a group coming to build or regularly, no skills necessary, skills welcome. We are starting a new project um, this summer on Landis Street, very near to here, Landis and 18th Street, where we've cleared the property and we'll be building six homes, paired homes, also known as duplexes, for the first time. And we're excited about that project. We will also, that besides it being our first multifamily homes, they will be our first permanently affordable homes. means that we will continue to own the land and we will sell the homes and a lease will tie the two together and in exchange for a very affordable mortgage people agree to limit their future appreciation on the house so we're excited about that the last thing I wanted to tell you about, many of you have heard, we just purchased 17 acres of property in Port Hadlock. Really exciting, a number of community members came to us and said, would you consider this? Right now, if we were to build, we could build three homes on it, how it's zoned. But the sewer's starting this winter, right Brent? Yep. And we will be able to build more than 120 homes altogether. in a mixed income permanently affordable community, which means about a third of the homes will be Habitat for Humanity homes. 
and about two thirds of the homes will be affordable to people who are a little bit higher income, but still very moderate income. So nurses and teachers and people who live in this community and cannot afford to live here. So keep your ears open for that. We'll be doing a lot of um, messaging in the community. We'd love to talk to your group. Meet us out at the table in the back by the tree. Thank you so much. And I'm introducing Paul Hines and Elizabeth Heiner for the Jefferson Interfaith Council. Yay! So Paul has the dog somewhere, so it's just me. So I'm Elizabeth Heiner, I'm the president of Jefferson Interfaith Action Coalition, and that really means that I send the emails that invite people to the meetings, but I think anytime you can have a female president of anything, I'm going to lift that up. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Ben's mom. <laughs> so, um, Jefferson Interfaith Action Coalition is a registered nonprofit that seeks to mobilize people of any spiritual walk to action. Formed in response to issues around immigration, a gathering of individuals from different faith communities joined together to nurture positive awareness and change. Drawing on the resources of our faith traditions, learning from each other, inspired by and in partnership with the broader community, we work to support justice, peace, and human worth. Yeah. Yeah. The coalition's work includes supporting the outreach of Jasira, uh, Jefferson County Immigrant Rights Advocates, holding a celebration for Martin Luther King Day, and most recently a vigil, a vigil for gun violence. The Interfaith Coalition uh, also established the Winter Welcoming Center, which recently concluded its fourth season, and that is why I'm here um, to talk with you about today. The Winter Welcoming Center provides shelter during the day to those who are struggling with homelessness. We aim to provide warmth, community, resources, and nurturance to our guests. The center is open during winter months, seven days a week from 8.30 to 12.30 p.m. and extended hours during extreme weather conditions. The Winter Welcoming Center is a community endeavor. For the past two seasons, the city of Port Townsend has generously provided the Pope Marine building free of charge in order for us to be able to provide this service. Thank you, John Morrow. Yeah. We regularly collaborate with the homeless shelter so that we are serving those in need as well as we can. This past season, Jefferson County Public Health provided guidance and free testing kits so that we could keep guests as safe as possible during COVID. Through com the community's generous donations, 166 laundry vouchers were given out, as well as donations of clothing, hand warmers, computers, and printers so that our guests could have access to the internet if needed. Donations allowed us to provide employment to four staff members, two managers, and two monitors, all of whom have experienced homelessness in the past or are currently homeless. We are so grateful for the incredible generosity and grace given to us. This past season from December through March, we had over 1,751 total visits. That's an average of 13 people per day who were able to find shelter with us. We hope to continue to provide a sense of welcome, community, and shelter for those who are in need. Through your volunteering and donations and time, we can continue to make that happen. So that is why, what we would, what we can use from you and what we need from you. Um, and we are just so appreciative of this community and your generosity. You have made it possible for us to, to help others in this way. So thank you so much. And now I would like to introduce Greg Brotherton, uh, Jefferson County Commissioner. Good to see everyone. I'm Greg Brotherton. Glad to be here under the tent yet again. I've been at these meetings, I think, since the beginning. And I'm going to talk not a lot about the regulatory uh, framework that John alluded to a little bit, but I'm sorry, this seems a little loud, um, but about boxes. Um, one of my former peers, uh, County Commissioner Sullivan, talked a lot about the box that we work in, in in county government. And we get a lot more credit and a lot more blame than we probably deserve for a lot of things. But about boxes, you know, we have a step away. Uh, we have a framework that we can work in within and creative ideas come all the time and sometimes we can't do anything about them. And I use this line myself quite a few times and in the conversations under the, the tent with all the, the community members and groups and interfaith organizations, faith-based organizations, I found there is a lot of work we can do outside of that box. So I guess the ask I have for people outside of the box is keep having these conversations, you know. I feel like we have these meetings after meetings and eventually we get trapped 
action, and I feel like we have it. So this, continuing this, is a big ask. So thank you. And then I also want to spend a moment inside the box and uh, introduce our, our uh, community development director, Brent Butler. We have lots of work we do. Come on, Brent. And I'm going to cede the rest of the time because we're going to be here afterwards talking. We have a lot of work that we want to do as a county. And Brent is going to bring on July 11th back to the county commissioners a work plan that is more ambitious than we can do. So we need help in, in, in uh, ratcheting that in and defining that box. So. I've given you 30 seconds for all the work. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And on the 11th, we're going to be um, getting from the community uh, input so the council can make a decision uh, where we should invest our resources. The C Pacer program, which is the commercial property assessed clean energy, which enables uh, uh, property owners to uh, redevelop their properties in a way that is sustainable. And there's uh, some projects in Port Hadlock that are being considered. Inclusionary housing, which says that when you you're building housing that a certain percentage of the housing should be affordable to the local workforce. Uh, <laughs> plans, which enables people to uh, go to the county, uh, pull a set of plans off the shelf, yeah. and um, to build from those plans. Yeah. Uh, supportive housing, uh, making sure that uh, we have a range of housing uh, resources available. And um, vacation rentals. How do we address um, the surge in vacation rentals in the county so that they are not taking away from housing for the workforce? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Come talk to us. Come on the 11th. Let us know, and uh, we will introduce. Uh, up next from the land trust is Richard Tucker. Richard. Thank you. Um, many of you wonder what's the land trust doing regarding housing. I mean, is it on a mission? It actually, it isn't a part of our mission. However, there are opportunities for partnership where we can partner with organizations who it is their mission and we can actually get a win-win situation, more housing and also protect lands that matter, whether it's riparian areas along a creek, whether it's forest areas or also working farms. Um, we are working on several new programs. One is buy, protect and sell, it's mainly geared towards farmland. But anyway, um, buy, protect and sell is where we work, purchase a piece of farmland put an easement on it, which is where we buy the development rights, so it actually makes the land less um, less expensive, and then sell it to a, a starting farmer. Uh, we want to make access to land important in Jefferson County. Yeah. We are just starting this program. We have more farmers who want to farm than we have land for them to buy, uh, and the land is getting more expensive. But what I'm here to talk about today is our Chimicum Commons project. Eight years ago, we purchased a 16 acres in downtown Chimicum. It's right behind the farm stand. It's across from Senex. Uh, our goal was to protect the riparian areas along Chimicum Creek, which we've done by, by planting a, a, the buffer. We've also wanted to make sure we protected the farmland, which we have. Actually, if you go out there now, you'll see it's being farmed. There's a, a farmer who has some pigs and some row crops on it. But also, we wanted to provide housing. And our original idea was we wanted to have farm worker housing because working with the farming community, we realized that many of the farm workers live in tents, campers, and shacks on the different farms. So we wanted to provide a, a, a safe place for them to live. Uh, and so that was our goal. Well, we went out around and we tried to find partners in the community. We're not a, we're not a housing developer. We don't manage housing. That's really not in our wheelhouse, but we had the land. Uh, and at the time, we did a we did a study with the Office of Farm Worker Housing about whether with the feasibility of doing this in Chimicum, and we were told probably not because we needed a willing partner. So the project kind of put was put on the back shelf for a while, but we still own the land. <laughs> well, now we have a we have a request for interest out. We want to have three objectives for the property. We're looking for partners to help us build housing, whether it's farm worker housing or starter homes. We want to protect the riparian area. We want to protect the farmland and provide a housing opportunity out there in Chimicum. Please contact me at the Land Trust if you're interested in submitting a letter of interest. We actually had a deadline of tomorrow, but we're going to be extending that to get more people to apply and come talk to us. We want to build partners who bring people together who will actually help create some housing opportunities in Chimicum, as well as protecting the farmland.
And I'm to introduce Kathy Moore from OLICAP. I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the projects that we're currently doing. Um, I'm sure everybody has seen the big building over by QFC. Um, so that is called Seventh Haven. And that has studio, one bedrooms, uh, two bedrooms, and three bedrooms. Step up, Kathy. You turned it down. Most have... Uh, fabulous views, nice windows. It's going to be a, a really awesome place for people to live. So there's 43 units in all, 22 are for homeless. We have 32 uh, project based Section 8 vouchers. We have five units set aside for developmentally disabled. We have three units set aside for uh, uh, Discovery Behavioral Health and Safe Harbor. We have two set aside for Dove House and we have 10 set aside for veterans. So we're hoping. We will also be able to get 10 uh, bash vouchers, which is like a Section 8 voucher, but for veterans. So we're really hoping that we have opened it up for all the different demographics so they have a really nice place to live. That will be completed, um, and it's going on schedule, so it should be completed by the end of this year. And we will be opening the doors to take applications somewhere in January, maybe February. Um, and we'll let everybody know it'll be in the paper. Um, and then we're hoping to have full occupancy for, thank you, um, uh, for March and April. Caswell Brown. We, I don't know if anybody's been out there, um, but we have um, the folks that came from the fairgrounds. We are now working on putting up to 50 people down, um, kind of like a campground setting. You should come out and take a look at it. We'll do an open house um, for the homeless, and it's transitional. And we're in the middle right now of putting an application together to build an emergency shelter on the phase one part with permanent supportive housing. So we're going to have a combination of different things going on this property um, to try and meet the need. And families will be welcomed in all the different phases. So I just want to let everybody know about that. So what we have um, instead of housing, but for those who need housing or need to stay in their housing, we've been able to secure over $9 million in rental assistance that we currently have for people within the community to help stay in their homes. Wow. The one ask I'm asking is I need volunteers. I need volunteers at Castle Brown. I need volunteers at the shelter with Coast. I need volunteers um, desperately. So that is my big ask of all of you, um, is to volunteer and be part of it. And we're hiring. Be part of our team. I'm going to introduce uh, my colleague, Jesse Thomas, with Olympic um, Housing Trust. Yay, Jesse! I'm with the Olympic Housing Trust. Uh, we are a community land trust a membership-based organization that stewards land for the good of the community. We take land out of the speculative market and hold it in the trust. Housing that is developed on the land is resale price restricted. Thus, it remains permanently affordable. Um, yeah! And not only can the housing trust provide permanent and affordable housing ownership, but can also serve other community needs such as workforce rentals, tiny home communities, artist spaces, community gardens, and so on and so on. The Housing Trust is a tool that gives community agency in developing land and preserving spaces. It is a locally run and locally responsive to the needs of the community. What we're up to, we are in the early stages of planning a multifamily condominium project in Port Townsend for low income home, home ownership. The project includes stewardship of a community garden. We're excited about this project and we'll be seeking donations on the next phase of pre-construction work in the fall. Uh, we have a new website up, olympichousingtrust.org. It's pretty exciting. We have two new board members, Terry and Ted. They're great. Um, we are moving right along. Uh, go visit us, visit us at the table. We have the best looking table over there, <laughs> I have to say. And get involved. Sign up for membership. Please sign up for membership. It's a membership organization. Get involved. Think about joining the board, becoming an advisor, helping us with a uh, 
fundraising campaign for staff in the fall. Um, and lastly, we want to hear from you. So come talk to us. Thank you. And by the birdhouses, they're beautiful. Um, next up is Pat Teal, Peninsula Housing Authority. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Pat Teal. I'm currently chair of the board for the Peninsula Housing Authority, and I'm a resident commissioner, which means I'm a client of them, and I have been for a long time, so I can attest to what good work we do. <laughs> um, it's a, the Housing Authority is a special purpose quasi-governmental agency that administers affordable and low-income housing programs in Jefferson and Clallam County. The PHA currently owns or manages 500 affordable rental units. And we administer over 900 housing choice vouchers. And we've built over 120 affordable single-family homes between Clallam and Jefferson County. And I live in one of those homes. I built my own home. Um, we're one of the few counties in the whole country that has a Section 8 home ownership program. Yeah. So our current, our, the Section 8 wait list is currently open, but only till tomorrow. So if you know anybody that wants to get on Section 8, I've got applications over here. They have to be postmarked or done online by tomorrow. The mission is to promote, the, of our agency, is to promote safe, affordable housing and foster effective partnerships to meet the goals. We value community partnership and support which assist us in meeting our mission. Currently, currently, we are looking for developed land in Jefferson County with access to public utilities and in order to get ready for a more mutual self-help uh, housing program. Um, this assists low to moderate income folks build their own homes. Um, we need a minimum of six lots near each other to do this because the homeowners to be work together to build their houses. We also need landlords willing to rent to our Section 8 clients. Rent is paid every month. You know, they have to pass a minimal um, quality inspection. They have to be, the, the rental has to be safe, um, healthy, and so forth. But the landlord gets paid. And during a pandemic? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, <laughs> and HUD, set, HUD sets the fair market rents. Um, we can go slightly above that, but there are limits to how much rent the Section 8 program can pay. Um, and lastly, we need another Jefferson County Commissioner on our board. Yeah. <laughs> we need to uh, raise our profile on Jefferson County so we can do more here. Thank you. Carmen San Diego and Malcolm Dorn. Hi, I'm Celine Santiago and I'm from Fort Townsend Preservation Alliance and um, our team has been working on a 13 acre intergenerational community based in permaculture just up the street at San Juan and Discovery and uh, we've been working on that for about six years now and we have been through revisions and awaiting code changes and we've resubmitted now our application to the city on March 25th and we're awaiting approval. So in the meantime, we've been working on different components of the project in order to get a, a good start and we have started our farm. We've started um, a farm-based child care program. We have a boarding house that's being created. Uh, we also have a culinary component that's being started, a junior art farm program going on, and we now have a new farmer who's running the greenhouses. We also have planned... Yeah. Thanks. Uh, we also have planned a diverse array of housing, and Malcolm will describe what we'll have on site. Thank you, Celine. My name is Malcolm Dorn, and I am grateful that I get to be a part of this project. Um, the Nomura property was very special to me for many years, and I knew the family. And they really wanted to sell the property to somebody who shared the vision of community benefit and they found Celine and Adriana mm -hmm. and so we have quite a diverse uh, array of housing that we're uh, proposing here all the way from single family residences up near the other single family residences uh, all the way to some live work small cottages a little co-housing uh, the uh, single family residences also have ADUs, so some rentals uh, associated with them. At the center is a, a daycare facility for elders and for children, and they have a common area that they share in the middle. Wow. Um, and over, yeah, it's, it's 
the core of the whole thing. And then over the elder part, there's also elder housing. So pretty broad array. We're trying to change the channel on what enough means. So these little tiny cottages are only like 600 square feet on a tiny lot, but you could own it, fee simple. Uh, some of the apartments will be rentals. So affordability is built right into the program. Yay! Oh, yeah. Yes, we are also looking for investors and partners. So please come talk to us at the table over here. We'll be happy to chat with you. Great. And okay. who's next? What? Who are you introducing? Oh, you're right. <laughs> who's next? I have it here somewhere. Somebody. Thank you. Uh, Sophie Ilan from Sophie, Repa Real Estate yeah. Professional. Sophie, take it away. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Um, like a lot of you here, I'm wearing a couple hats, but I'm up here to talk to you about REPA, which stands for Real Estate Professionals for Affordable Housing. And REPA is a nonprofit and totally volunteer organization uh, that's been around since 1992 in Jefferson County. Uh, we provide financial assistance to low-income homeowners in Jefferson County to make emergency repairs and safety improvements to their home. We are um, sustained largely by donations from real estate agents and affiliates, industry affiliates. We partner with other local nonprofits, foundations, and contractors to do the work that we do. And our goal is to maintain affordable housing stock and promote affordable home ownership um, and help homeowners remain safely in their homes. Uh, an example of projects that we take on are anything from repairing leaking windows, mold removal, pest mitigation, installing wheelchair accessibility ramps and grab bars, doing heating repairs, replacing hot water heaters. Um, we do have a cap of $5,000 per applicant and project, but for larger projects like roof repair, septic repair, or replacement, we team up with our community partners that we love like Habitat and OliCap to make that happen. Um, what we need right now are applicants. We have funds to give and we can take on more projects. We need applicants. We have funds to give to low-income homeowners that are needing help with deferred maintenance on their home so that they can remain safely in their home. Um, and that's what REPA does. Yay. And I have the pleasure of introducing Liz Revord um, with Housing Solutions Network. Um, I'm probably going to yell into this because I know it is hard to hear in the back. Um, hi. My name is Liz Reboard. I am the new director of Housing Solutions Network. We are these people. We are these people. So you should have all received this brochure in your mail. It went out to every county mailbox here in Jefferson County and it is promoting our new campaign about sharing our spaces. So I'm going to go a little bit over what HSN is. I do have my notes with me. Um, we have a new mission statement, which is really exciting. So I'm here to share it with you today. Um, Housing Solutions Network is an initiative of Jefferson Community Foundation. Um, our mission is to increase access to housing for lo local workers. Um, our network serves as a hub for the community to inspire, to inform, to create, and to advocate. We envision a thriving and diverse community in which the people who live and work in East Jefferson County have access to an abundance of desirable and affordable housing options. All right, so how do we do this? We do this through our housing action teams, our HATS. So we do this through our tiny homes communities. These people incubate tiny home communities and developments of all sizes. We do this through our out outreach hat. We are, here, we are here to engage and educate the community on the housing crisis. We have declared a housing emergency. Yes, we have. And we're here to provide solutions. We're here to, our housing action teams also include our sanitation, our permit, and our zoning hats. We're here to reduce barriers to affordable developments, including financing, regulations, or policies. And we're here with our housing connections hat to increase the units through uh, development and finance opportunities. So our ask today is we need volunteers of all levels on all of our hats. This includes people with advocacy, policy, 
and engaging the city and the county officials so we can remove these barriers. We need people with fundraising experience. We all need money and we all need volunteers. We get it. (laughs) Uh, We need contractors and designers to help with those pre-approved ADU programs that Brent was talking about earlier. So if you have any of those experience or skill sets, we need you. Come talk to us. We're under the purple tent. We also need donations, of course. We need uh, one-time or monthly contributions. And ideally, it's beautiful outside, and we have six months of really lovely weather in the Pacific Northwest. But in the winter, we need meeting spaces. We want to meet with, with people. We want to have that one-on-one engagement. We're very lucky that we're renting office space from Malcolm Dorn, um, who just continues to support this community in very many ways, as many as all of you do. Yeah. All right. So if you're concerned about um, affordable workforce housing, or if you have a house for me to buy, because I'd also like to stay here, um, come chat. We're under the purple tent. And with that, I will also just thank the people who are hosting us today, Judy and Debbie and Carla. And I will give it over to Carla, who is also a HSN volunteer. And I appreciate all of you here, because um, this is just really hard, right? Like. We're, we're, it's hard, so today we do the work, and tomorrow we make the change. That's what we're talking about, making change. So, how about I learned a bunch this afternoon? How about you? I learned a ton this afternoon. I'm going to go with my notes so that I don't go over because I don't have, I can't stop myself from talking up there. Um, let's have a round of applause for all these organizations and all the amazing work they're doing. Let's have a round of applause for all the volunteers that are working on all of these issues and all the people in our community that have mobilized. So I don't know about you, but I moved here 21 years ago, and one of the reasons I moved here, I I mean, I moved here because it's a gorgeous, fabulous, wonderful place, but I moved here because of the people. I moved here because of the community. I moved here because I was welcomed here. And it, I've lived in small towns before where I was not welcomed or where I didn't feel welcomed. And I want this place to continue to be welcoming for everyone. I do not want to live in a place that is only available to people who can buy a $750,000 house or pay $1,500 a month for rent. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons all of us are working so hard is to continue the diversity of folks that are living in our community and the opportunities that's available to them. Um, I love uh, the fact that so many people are con- contributing and are creating relationships. I think that's it, there's a ton of opportunities for us to do that this afternoon. Um, I know you are here because you care about this community, and I know that each of us have people that we don't want to lose, whether it's our the person who cuts our hair or the person who, who sells us produce at the farmer's market or the person who is our dental hygienist because we all love our dental hygienists, don't we? <laughs> Um, all of those folks need to have a place to live in our community. Um, or DJs on KPDZ, that was another thing I was going to say. DJs on KPDZ, they should live here too. Um, so uh, I want you to think about who you heard from today that provoked you or that that you had extra questions about or that you wanted to go up and give them a high five and say, gosh, you guys are doing great work. I had no idea. So think about that for just a moment while I continue blathering and and because there's a lot of opportunity to go and talk to folks and get additional information. But I want you also to think about what can I, meaning you, what can I do? Can I contribute some money? Can I contribute some time? Do I have some ideas about some places that are on my block that could house an ADU? Um, whatever you can come up with, what, how, whatever discussions you can have with your neighbors, however you can provoke some action on the part of people, I'm tired of complaining about it. I want to do something about it. And hopefully you guys are all in the same boat. We can't resolve this issue by ourselves, but we can resolve it together. We can approach it together. And that's what we're all asking you to do. Thank you very much. So uh, we are really excited to say that we have this space available for 
uh, more conversations under this tent about our housing crisis in our community. And we have a wonderful group of people who've stepped up to host the next conversation on the final Thursday of July. And that are folks with our interfaith community. And we're going to hear what churches are now doing and, and uh, synagogues and all the other faith communities in our community and opportunities to be able to do additional work. Coast is a great example of that work over the past, how many years, Karen? 18, 18 years. So we want to get our faith community really engaged and start folks thinking about what can our church do? What can we do as a faith community to live what we believe? They get a, a buyer can get a mortgage at a reduced amount okay. because USDA has been doing most of the mortgages and they have a, a lower interest rate. Mm -hmm. Plus, they they have a mission to help people who are lower income. And they'll they'll write a mortgage on a on a home that's on a lease for the brown. Yes. I mean, yes. Why? Because um, the Olympic Housing Trust already owns five houses that are in Port Angeles. It was part of Homeward Bound, uh, the predecessor to the Olympic Trust. Not and the movie. Have, no, not the movie. Great movie. Yeah, yeah, no, no dogs and involved. Yeah. Okay, so, sort of so there's five houses in Port Angeles where Olympic Housing Trust owns the land. The houses are owned by the mortgagee, mm -hmm. and they have a lower interest monthly payment. Excellent. And it's, is it like a 99-year ground lease or something? Yeah. It's a very yeah. So that's really cool. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's a great model because it's a way of keeping the um, price low. Sean, you should be in on this. Well, I'm a little eavesdropping. Sorry it's okay. About that. <laughs> You're a vet, aren't you? I'm what? Are you a veteran? Yeah. Well, one of the housing things that the there's an apartment building up like UFC. All they cap is doing is apartment building that's not finished yet, but it's going to be finished in a it's called Seventh Haven. Seventh Haven. And you can apply for housing in this supportive uh, multi-family apartment building. And they're reserving 10 units for veterans applications. And they have a total of 48 or something in the in the building. I mean, it's enormous. I'm really curious about, you know, like they're, like who's been promised what over there when they were just breaking ground I was at the ground, groundbreaking uh, ceremony and I was talking to Kathy Morgan about uh, I don't think they have a promise to specific people I, because I, yeah, don't I, I don't know how they're planning to do it because it, you know, at that time I said so how quickly will you be able to fill these units and she says I can fill like you know uh, I think like 10 projects like this tomorrow and it happens so I don't know simple message but like show up at the city and say hi um, I think you probably need some more housing and how can I help and maybe there's some policy you want to change yeah other communities are doing X Y and Z can we do it here I mean, people do that to us all the time and we learn from each other and we evolve and I can't speak to the code swim unfortunately that's not even our county but um, you know as the city we have like everybody here I hope shows up at a city council meeting and says this is what we want and we're together on it that would be awesome because there's so many times people show up and say don't do anything don't change and if we want to allow ADUs or if we want to allow greater density or if we want to actually build housing we're going to have to do something not block something so